Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Nature Live Online. I'm Alison. I'm your host for today. Now, if you are a regular viewer of these shows, welcome. It's great to have you back. But if you're new to Nature Live Online, we're an event where we give you a chance to meet some of the scientists that work behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum in London. The museum has, of course, now opened its doors to the public and we've put lots of brilliant measures in place to make sure you can have a fantastic and a safe visit. But not everyone can make it to the museum. So every week we are bringing our science and our scientists direct to you at home with these talks. Now, today I am very excited to be joined by one of our curators, Jan, and we're going to be finding out all about spiders. Now, fair warning, if any of our viewers are a little nervous of spiders, we, we do obviously have a lot of spider imagery. We also have a live specimen as well. So, so just to warn you, but do stick with us if you are nervous. It will be worth it. And we are, of course, live. So this is your chance to ask your questions. So don't be shy. If you've got a question at any point during the show, pop it in the chat. We'll do our very best to answer as many of your questions as we can. But let's meet our speaker for today. Jan, are you there? I'm here. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jan, it's, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you now, for having me. Now, we'll, we'll start, first of all, by finding out what you do at the museum. OK, so uh, I'm a curator of arachnids and I'm responsible for around two and a half million specimens. So it's quite a few. <laughs> wow, that is quite a few. <laughs> and a very good job you do as well. But, um, but let's, be <laughs> let's begin with some basics. What exactly is, is an arachnid? arachnid what what does that group comprise okay well basically arachnids are here's a, a selection of different arachnids so it's not just spiders but it's scorpions and ticks and mites and various other animals but what links them all together as a group is that they've got two body parts um eight legs and they've got a pair of structures at the front called pedipalps that are have got claws uh in scorpions and pseudoscorpions, but they're kind of leg-like structures in spiders. And they have quite an important function, quite a few important functions. Now, you, you look after a, a huge number of specimens at the museum, but, yeah. but they, they're not just uh, gathering dust in drawers, are they? How are, how are our collections used? Absolutely not. Um, they're used by the scientific community around the world so we welcome uh, visitors from like, so around the world. Also, artists will look at them and use them uh, in their artwork. Um, and not only do we have visiting scientists, but we send specimens um, to uh, researchers. Um, we also are digitising the collections, which makes it much more, uh, it gives brings them to a broader audience so that if we have pictures of the images and the data labels and that kind of thing people can see them virtually so they're definitely not gathering dust behind the scenes and we of course use our collections for for a lot of outreach and i know you're really passionate about positive pr for spiders because they oh, often need it <laughs> yeah they, they do need it really but yes i love to bring my specimens from behind the scenes to um various outreach uh, not just in the museum, but I've gone to schools and that kind of thing as well. And uh, people respond very well in general uh, to see the, the real you know, specimens. And you, Nature Life is a, sorry, I've said Nature Life is a really good opportunity um, for people to come down after the show and have a look at the, the specimens from behind the scenes. And there's always children surrounding specimens. It's lovely to see so many young people interested it really is and your outreach gets you uh, gets you to meet some interesting people from time to time doesn't it we've got an image here tell us how the situation came about oh my goodness that was in the days when i was a bit slimmer and prince william had more hair but um this was back in 2009 and uh when we opened our darwin center where we usually hold our nature lives and um, I was asked to hand a live tarantula to them. And there, during the few weeks leading up to this event, there was a bit of 
communication between the palace and the museum as to whether this uh, critter was highly venomous and, or not. And I basically thought to myself, well, if it was uh, like highly toxic, would I be holding it? And the answer is no. So I wouldn't have been handing it to the future king either. But you can see <laughs> he looks somewhat nervous. And when I did hand it over to him, he had very sweaty palms. <laughs> I can sympathise. As you know, I have strongly mixed feelings about spiders. We've had a comment from uh, Carol on, on Facebook saying that she is arachnophobic, but trying to learn to love them, as, as I am as well. For me, lots of reasons, but mainly the way they move, that, that kind of creeps me out. But in your experience, Jan, what, what is it about spiders that, that make people nervous? Well, it's, it's a surprisingly broad spectrum of different things that people don't like. I mean, you get the, the usual... They don't like their long hairy legs, um, the way they move, because they're quite skittish, really. Mm. Um, uh, sometimes people say that the fact that they quite often pop up in unexpected places, like in the bath or something. Mm. Um, but also I've had people say that they're scared of them because they've got eight eyes. Now, that intrigues me somewhat because obviously people can't see their eyes. I mean, look at those beautiful eyes. So people can't see their eyes, um, but they're scared of the, the fact that they've got them. So it's basically, I think, something that's not like us, um, that people, anything that is like beyond mammal, I think people start to really not like them very much. Mm. But Jan, why do you love spiders? What is it about spiders that, that you think is so brilliant? Well, that's a hard question to answer, Alison, <laughs> um, because there's so many amazing things about spiders, you know, their behaviour, so like their really intricate courtship. And, you know, the spider might be only two centimetres long, and yet it has this most elaborate courtship, which hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about soon in this talk. Um, the, their other behaviours what they look like um I mean, look at the different colors we see just of these six different species um yeah they're just really incredible animals they are amazing and so diverse we can just see just from that that one image there that's the tiny yeah. snapshot and, and so whereabouts do do we find them are they pretty much everywhere in the world all sorts of habitats yeah all except antarctica um you get you find them in deserts, in forests. Um, we have uh, the one aquatic spider, which is one in the world we have in this country. Um, so it actually lives underwater in a little bubble of air. Um, and the, the one that intrigues me the most is the species of jumping spider that has been found at Mount Everest. Um, and wow. it, what it does... Is thought that to um, keep, you know, from freezing, it lives under the snow, um, which we know as humans, they build like igloos and whatever, uh, and it is quite insulating once you're inside. Um, but these little spiders, they feed on um, very small invertebrates that have uh, been blown up the slopes of the mountains and yeah they live their whole lives up there it's incredible that really is I've, i learned something new every time i speak to you janet it's, it's oh, fantastic you, <laughs> <laughs> and one habitat we obviously do find them in is is our homes and particularly oh, at this yeah. time of year why 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 do we see them so much around about now mating season so <laughs> um this, the image we see here, this is a male spider. We know he's a male spider because he's got like these little boxing gloves stretched at the front. And the males uh, are on the hunt for females. The females tend to remain static and the males are on the search for a female. So that's why you tend to find uh, them popping up at this time of the year. But I just have to say, I must just dispel a myth this guy, he hasn't come up the plug hole, okay? What happened here is he's fallen into the bath and it acts like a big trap and it basically holds in there because he can't grip on the shiny sides of the bath. Mm. 
Now we're um, we're going to talk a little bit more about courtship a little bit later, but we did have an interesting question just while on we're on the subject of being mating season from Rona on YouTube asking when do their spiders eggs hatch generally in the UK? Is there a specific oh. time of year? Hello, Rona. Um, it depends on the species. Um, you do get spiders that what we call overwinter, so they kind of hibernate uh, as eggs. Um, other spiders, the eggs hatch later in the autumn and they overwinter as little juvenile spiders and they might get down into the, the undergrowth and like hide away there. So um, then some spiders will actually overwinter as adults. So um, if, you're, if you're a spider that lives uh, further north in the country, it's a bit cooler, you might have a, a lifespan of two years, so you have to overwinter as an adult. So it very much depends on the species of spider. Um, and a question from um, Mike that is, is related on, on YouTube. He was asking how many babies that they can have, how many babies in, in one sack or how many babies at any one time? <laughs> well, yeah, it depends. Okay, you, you're going to get this answer from me a lot, Alison. It depends on the species. So some spiders might produce just about 100 or so um eggs and others can uh, lay quite a few thousand but obviously having if you're an a spider i tend to kind of get into the the kind of mindset of a spider how weird is that but I love it so if you're a spider and you have a lot of eggs then the chances of your eggs hatching and growing to adulthood is much higher the more eggs that you have but obviously the more eggs that you have the more you have to kind of uh, with certainly with the spiders that have parental care, there's more eggs to look after, so you've got kind of like a balancing act there, really. Uh, just before we move on, we've had a, a lovely question from Hannah on uh, YouTube again asking this is quite a cool question why do spiders have eight legs? Why eight? Why not six or any other number? Why did it evolve like that? Well. Having eight legs is a massive advantage to the spider um, because, and I've seen this so many times that I've caught an adult spider in you know, my studies or whatever, invariably they have at least one leg missing. So it's actually very advantageous to have quite a few legs because if several of, say if you get caught by a predator um, and you have a few legs ripped off, you've still got a few others to be getting on with. Now, the good thing about molting, you know, where the um, external, we call it a skin, but it's not strictly speaking a spit of skin, but the external carapace and whatever gets shed um, in order for the spider to increase in size. Um, and that only happens up till adulthood, but it, in general. Um, but where you have the molting process, the spiders can regenerate their legs. So that's actually um, a really amazing thing. And that's great because if you've got a long-lived spider like a tarantula, they, they do actually keep molting through adulthood. That gives them a chance to regenerate their legs. And they live for about 25 years or so. So it, it's really <laughs> important to be able to regenerate those legs. That's incredible. So it, it actually relates to a question that Erica was asking on YouTube. Uh, she was asking, how do they still survive if when they lose some of their legs? She says she yeah. often thinks spiders who only seven legs a lot. Yeah, but they, exactly. When they're younger, they can regenerate. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you know, as long as you've got a few, um, then, you know, I've seen spiders with like four legs. And as long as they're not all on one side, they'd go around in circles, wouldn't they? But it oh, still gives them a chance to move around. Um, and just one more question from our, our viewers. We're getting so many in, which is fantastic. Oh, that's and great. Oh, in. I love it. Um, but just uh, related to our, our um, house spider in the bath earlier, um, Joey was asking, if you find one in your house, a, a, a spider that, like that, should you put it outside? Well, I wouldn't, obviously, because I love spiders. <laughs> um, I, I would, if you would be happy to keep it in the house they keep it in the house because they actually are very good at keeping down pest um species and in fact actually can i bring in my live one at this moment 
Absolutely. I've got a live spider in this pot. They always say don't work with children and animals. So I'm a bit childlike and I've got an animal in a pot. What a bad combo. Anyway, <laughs> this is Felicia. She lives in the kitchen cupboard. She's uh, a daddy long leg spider, as we would call her. Um, and she uh, feeds on any uh, pest moths that we have. Sometimes they go for porridge oats, whatever. And she does a really good job at keeping them under control. So that's the very reason why we keep her in the kitchen cupboard. Let me just pop her on my hand. If she disappears, I'll have to look for her later. But okay. Whoop. She's very fast. She's fast. Yeah. Okay. She's just going down on a thread right now. Can you oh, see wow, her? Oh, yeah. But oh, um, yeah, yeah, she's a very useful spider to have in the kitchen cupboard. Uh, I've got to... Oh, oh, hold on. She's making a dash. Right. <laughs> I've got her under, under the pot on my dress at the moment. Hold on. Let me just put her back. Oh, yeah. She's in. Good. Right. I, here we go. I've got her. Um, I wanted to show you this uh, critter as well because I wanted to dispel the myth that these daddy long leg spiders are highly venomous. They're really not. Um, and they can't even pierce your skin with their little fangs. And if they did, you wouldn't have problems with the venom anyway because it's so you know, weak on the human system. Well, while we're on the, the subject of venom, let's get this one out of the way because we've had a couple of questions in from viewers related to to, to poison um, and venom, and that's a big source of, of fear, isn't it, for for some people when it comes to spiders? This idea that they they bite and they're they're dangerous. Um, and we had a, a nice question from Claire on Facebook. Um, yeah, saying, I saw that. Jan, yeah, your your knowledge and passion is obvious, but are there any spiders? you would avoid or be nervous about handling perhaps because they're they're, they're venomous what, what are some of the the most venomous spiders out there or the or the most toxic and how worried should we be okay so yeah this is a nice uh, set of images of some of the the more notorious uh highly toxic spiders so we've got black widow we have a brazilian wandering spider we've got sydney funnel web brown recluse you know i wouldn't advocate handling any of those to be honest um and yeah and especially also tarantulas as well they're they're big and hairy uh and i know yeah i mean i've handled as you saw pictures of me um, handing a live tarantula to Prince William but you have to be very careful that you don't damage the spider and certain uh, tarantulas have urticating or irritating hairs that can actually embed in the skin or get in your eyes and that kind of thing so we don't really advocate handling spiders um, mm. certainly you saw me with that little uh, Felicia from the kitchen cupboard but um, yeah you've just basically got to give them respect um, and so, yeah, I wouldn't suggest that you handle spiders particularly. And if you want to remove uh, a spider from your house, like I've suggested, you keep it there. But just get a pot like I had my spider in, put a pot over the top and then maybe like a, a, a drinks coaster underneath. And then you just pop the spider outside. Mm -hmm. Um, a question from uh, Paulina on Facebook came in a little earlier. She was asking, "How do you recognise when a when a spider might be might be venomous? Is there mm. a way to tell?" Well, uh, yeah, it's a very good question. <laughs> um, if you, if I would suggest, if in doubt, don't handle it at all. Um, but certainly certain venomous spiders have coloration that is uh, depicts their venomosity. So for example, the black widow spider, it has the red pattern on it. So mm -hmm. if you saw one like that, you would know that it had a uh, highly toxic venom, but you do get mimicry happening within the spider world. So certainly not just in spiders, you get mimicry happening across the whole of the animal kingdom, but um, where you'll get some spiders that pretend or, or pretend to uh, be highly venomous when they're not. So, for example, the ladybird spider, we saw it one of the earlier slides. 
it's red with black spots and that is mimicking a ladybird spider which is actually distasteful so it's not always easy to tell if something's highly venomous or not but just err on the side of caution but it depends mm -hmm. also which country you're in as well so if you're in australia brazil places like that then the chances are you're more likely to encounter uh, a highly toxic spider yeah so keeping a respectful distance what what yes. do they use the venom for is it to is it to catch a prey yeah basically to subdue their prey um and it's very costly for the the spider's body to produce venom um so what it does it it when it injects the venom it it can just inject a little bit uh and then if that's not enough to subdue the prey then it'll inject more so it's actually being quite conservative with the amount of venom it injects um so subsequently um spiders when they're protecting themselves they will only use venom when it's absolutely necessary so if they feel at risk of you know being caught by a predator or partially squashed or whatever then they will buy it but otherwise they won't use their venom in that way usually and we're quite lucky in the UK, aren't we? We don't have dangerous spiders as such. Do we have any that are highly toxic at all? None that are highly toxic, but we have uh, the notorious group of spiders called false widow spiders. And I think it's a little bit unfortunate that they um, have that name because obviously people associate them with black widow spiders. And they're only called false widow spiders because they look superficially like them and they're in the same kind of family group. Um, now, these guys, they can pack a punch when they bite. Um, and, and some people have uh, demonstrate uh, worse effects than others. Um, but nobody has died from being uh, envenomated by one of these spiders. And... You know, the, the the problem of them is vastly over kind of exaggerated in the press. Um, and you often get, you know, headlines saying someone's bitten, been bitten by a spider. Well, you don't get that with people being stung by wasps, etc. And wasps, for example, can be problematic if somebody has an allergic reaction. So, it, again, mm. it also depends on... Uh, the person in question as well and, and whether they're quite allergic but quite often things are assigned to bites to spider bites when actually not even a spider that has bitten the person but also you can get um, a secondary infection like through bacteria like MRSA that gets into the spider bite and causes all sorts of tissue damage and whatever that people attribute to the spider venom but it's actually not mm. the venom it's the infection afterwards so you know you have to be quite careful as to knowing you know whether somebody has actually been bitten by a spider in the first place absolutely um, and we had a, a a comment and a question from laura on youtube she was uh commenting that she she feels like false widow spiders are becoming more and more noticeable every year and asking whether they were an invasive species that's right yes they are in fact the the largest of all of them uh, the noblest or the noble false widow spider um actually came across to the its first um recorded on the south coast in the 19th century and it has been moving northwards but by living in houses and and other buildings it enables the spider to um, protect itself from you know the worst of the weather etc but certainly also those spiders they can um, get into things so they can accidentally be transported um, around the country and across you know internationally mm. so we can't rule out that kind of thing either so yeah mm. definitely you are seeing probably more of them um and, and just before we move on from from venom uh, rowan on facebook wanted to know what the most the world's most dangerous spider was and was it one of the the, the four we showed earlier yes the, exactly the, widow, the um, brazilian wandering yes, the tunnel webs brazilian wandering spider etc but just to reiterate that people um there are no records of people dying from spider bites now um, because of anti-venom 
Obviously, mm -hmm. if somebody's got an underlying health problem already, that makes them more susceptible. But um, I have to say, it's scorpions that kill many more people around the world every year than spiders do. We had a great question, actually, from... Um from Claire on Facebook asking whether there's been any research into the possible medicinal uses of spider toxins? Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, actually, um, certainly uh, spider venom has been used for, for you know, decades to produce anti-venom, which obviously then you can inject and it counteracts the effects of the venom. Um, but certainly also in pain relief. Um, and so I, I know it seems ironic, but um, venoms in general across invertebrates, for example, I'm just going to go off piece a little bit here. But um, my mum discovered this quite a few years ago. She was stung by a bee on her arthritic shoulder. And OK, after the initial pain has worn off from the, the bee sting, her shoulder didn't hurt anymore. So, you, you know, that is an um, example in the raw, if you like, of how venom can be used to um, for pain relief. It's, it's a fascinating subject and a, and a great question. Um, we should move on, though. We've got lots more questions coming in, which we will get to. Um, but let's uh, talk a bit about tarantulas, because we've, we've had a couple of questions. So people are often afraid of, of tarantulas, but does bigger necessarily mean more dangerous? No, no, definitely not. Um, in fact, uh, the most highly venomous spiders uh, in the world, none of them are the size of tarantulas. And in fact, yeah, it's definitely not size. It's not size related as to what kind of venom they produce. It very much depends on the species itself, which, like I say, tend to be the, uh, the smaller species. I'm not saying all, all small spiders, let me just kind of explain I'm not saying all small spiders are highly toxic that's not the case but you certainly don't get really highly toxic spiders that are large absolutely yeah. and they tarantulas do get to quite a big size don't we we have oh, quite a few people asking uh for example noah who's a regular viewer age six on facebook uh Hi, asking noah. What, hello noah asking what the biggest spider in the world is OK, so there's two ways of measuring this. Um, it's either leg span or weight. So the heaviest spider is the Goliath bird eating spider. Um, and especially the females, if they're a lot larger than the males, they can really be really quite weighty. And then you get a oh, great. Thank you, Ben. Um, so here we have one on the left. It's a preserved specimen, so it's a little bit dried and shriveled up. But if you had <laughs> uh, a live one, then you would see how really large they get. Um, and then the one on the right is the giant huntsman spider. That has the largest leg span, um, and that is found in caves. And um, cave animals, cave-dwelling invertebrates, tend to have longer legs and longer uh, antennae and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, that one does make me quite nervous. <laughs> oh, those legs. <laughs> oh, yes. Let's move on to a slightly more comfortable uh, topic, and that's that spider silk, which is a, oh, yes. a fascinating subject. They, we're all very familiar with, with spiders' webs, but they use silk for all sorts of other things, don't they? Definitely. So um, if we uh, just look at or, or think about... Um, spider different spider species so the more primitive spiders like the the um tarantulas they produce kind of two different types of silk but uh the more advanced spiders like garden spiders they can produce up to seven different types of silk which is incredible and each different type of silk comes from a different type of silk gland in the spider's abdomen and they use the silk for different purposes. So, for example, if you see the top left, the, the classic, what we call orb web, uh, or it's called a wheel web as well, because it's thought to look like a bicycle wheel because of the spokes leading out from the central hub. Um, that has at least two different types of silk uh, forming that web. So we've got the sticky spiral silk, 
and then we have the non-sticky uh, structural um, radial threads. Um, and then we have spiders that have a drag line. So, for example, um, when a spider's walking across substrate, it'll uh, have a, it will drag a piece of silk along, and females will impregnate that drag line with pheromones, like um, a spider's version of perfume, and it will attract the male's attention. So the spider can actually follow the drag line and the pheromones on the drag line. Um, also, with earlier on, when I was ha handling the daddy long leg spider, you saw she came down on a thread of silk. So that is something else uh, that they use uh, as, a, as a kind of line to tether them to something. So for example, if a spider's walking along a leaf and you made it jump, it would drop off the leaf. But it actually, unbeknownst to us, it actually's got a thread of silk that can then climb back up again um, so it can get back to where it came from. Um, and then spiders line their burrows with silk and they also um, cover their eggs uh, to protect their eggs. So they produce egg sacs. So they have many different, um, you know, they, they produce many different things from silk. It's an, an incredible substance. It really is. And we've got quite a few questions coming in from our, our viewers, specifically about silk. Um, so right. Ranulf and Anton on, on Facebook were um, asking which spider makes the largest web and, and where where was it found? That's a tricky question. Do, do we know the answer to that one? Well, it is. You can get. Ah, right. There's two different answers I can give to this. <laughs> um, uh, one individual spider. Uh, is going to be the golden orb weaver spider. They can produce a web that's like a, at least a meter wide across. Um, but you also get very large webs produced by subsocial spiders, where you get lots of small spiders that are related, that all uh, live together in great. So they all produce their own little webs in kind of little layers, and it becomes a massive kind of lump of web. But that is produced by lots of different spiders. So yeah, two different answers there. But I think <laughs> we have we have um, something that golden orb weavers have uh, been made from their web. We do incredibly. We we do we use spider silk, don't we? we yes, and here's we a great example. Exactly. Now that is beautiful. I and mean, it doesn't really give the the really stunning colour that the spider silk has in real life. But this uh, cape has been made from Madagascan, the Madagascan species of golden orb weaver spiders. And um, it took the uh, makers seven years to gather all the silk from live <laughs> spiders out in the wild um, and then to weave it into this amazing cloak. It's not the most practical garment, but it, it does kind of show how beautiful that, um, that the spider silk can be. Um, but people all around the world use uh, spider silk for lots of different things, from technical things like uh, for medical sutures, uh, surgeons use, if they need a really fine but strong thread, they will use spider silk. Um, to uh, even using um, cobwebs, for example, to stem blood flow. Um, so you use it like a, a dressing. And people might think, oh, that's horrible. But actually, spider silk has antibacterial properties. So it's, it's actually a really good thing to use if you have a wound and you don't have a plaster. Um, people in, um, in the tropics, they will use uh, spiders webs as fishing nets and so on so actually yeah spider silk has very broad application for humans actually incredible number of, of uses it's, it's amazing um, we've had a couple more questions on uh, on silk so terence on facebook was asking are there any spiders in the uk that don't use a web to catch their prey they, they have another approach Fantastic question. Thank you for bringing that up, Terence. In fact, yes, certainly in the UK and across the world, only approximately 50% of all known species 
which is around 46,000 or so at the moment and counting, um, use silk to capture their prey. The rest are either what we call sit and wait predators, where they would sit, you get this with crab spiders, certainly in like um, you find uh, them in gorse, for example, that you can see them sitting there or, or in a daisy and they'll sit there with their legs out and they'll wait for their prey to come along and then they'll grab the prey. Or you get ones that actively seek their prey. So like jumping spiders um, are extremely good hunters and they use their exceptional vision to uh, stalk, literally they stalk their prey. Um, so yeah, spiders can manage perfectly well without silk. It depends again on the species. Um, and a great question from YouTube uh, asking, do all um, baby spiders do a form of ballooning for travelling? So that's one way they use silk, isn't it? Yes. Oh, that, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I forgot that. That's a really good way. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, ballooning is a very interesting phenomenon. Not all spiders use it, um, but a lot do. Um, and some adults, like, for example, money spiders, they're really small. Mm. Um, and they can use that. And what happens is that a spider will stand on kind of like tippy toes, if you like, um, and the silk by air currents is dragged out of the spinnerets, which are the little um, organs at the back. They're like little finger-like structures at the, on the, tip of the abdomen of the spider through which the silk comes. And once the uh, it's caught by the air flow, it pulls them up into the air. And also it's been found recently that electrostatic forces also increase the, the drag on the silk and it can pull them up into the air. And in that way, they can actually travel a very long distance. Some only travel a short distance. Some can actually uh, be found about a mile up into the, uh, into the air and be blown across the sea uh, and that is how you get spiders colonizing new islands mm. because they're blown there i mean they also get there by rafting so they might be on some wood that it's it's washed there and then they're washed up on the shore and then they'll start to you know inhabit the island or whatever but ballooning is definitely a way for them to move around but there's also another way where um, some spiders that are sub or semi-aquatic, so they live near water and they might move across water to capture their prey, they will lift their legs up, several legs, and hold their legs up and then be blown across the water. So they use their legs like a sail. Now, how incredible is that? That is fantastic. I'm learning so much, Jan. <laughs> So, so, so cool. <laughs> we we are running out of time though, and I, I I am quite keen to get onto our final topic, which is courtship in spiders. Oh, my, a few good. questions uh, are relating to to spiders and having babies and things. Um, so so let's let's talk a little bit about their amazing courtship behaviours because courtship is really important in spiders, isn't it? Why why Absolutely. do they need to court one another? Well, there's two main reasons. Firstly, uh, that the males need to ensure that the females are receptive um, because otherwise, if he doesn't uh, indicate to the female that he's a male and wanting to mate, the likelihood is he's going to be eaten. So that kind of is a bit of a non-starter. <laughs> um, and also, they need to ensure that uh, they're of the same species because Although you do get some kind of natural hybridization within spiders, um, it's not that common at all. And, and usually uh, it's just between, you know, males and females of the same species. So they need to ensure uh, that they're courting the right species. Now, here is a uh, golden orb weaver spider. We've mentioned them quite a few times in this talk, haven't we? I do like them, actually. They're amazing animals. They um, are amazing. It is a male and female. Now, the female is the large one and the male is the small one. And this, such a marked difference between the sexes is called sexual dimorphism. So di being two, so two different forms. Uh, and 
if he weren't to uh, enter into courtship, then he could definitely come a cropper because she could easily overpower him and eat him. So he has to tread carefully, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely look at that size difference and they've, yes. they've come up with all sorts of strategies haven't they some of them that are quite familiar to us so some spiders give gifts don't they nuptial gifts yeah. i think we call it That's my favorite. i really like this one <laughs> yes yeah, so it's there's a, a couple of families of spiders where this happens but uh what happens is the males they will um actually uh trap a fly something like that wrap it in silk and then he'll give it to the female um and she'll start to eat it and then he can mate with her so it keeps her big jaws occupied which is always a good way of doing it <laughs> but also it's been found that the larger the gift the more likely the female will accept the male which is kind of quite shallow really <laughs> But, um, and it's also been discovered that if males are interrupted during a mating, he will try and retrieve the gift to reuse for another female. <laughs> and it doesn't stop there because those uh, males that find it difficult, either because there isn't any available prey or they might be a bit rubbish at catching prey, then they've been found to wrap dried leaves and, and grasses and whatever in silk and hand it to the female. So she'll accept it because it's a nice big gift. Uh, and then he'll start to mate with her. And then when she unwraps it and starts to try and feed on it and finds that she's been conned, she'll get shot of him. But the male has ensured that he's got at least a chance to mate with her briefly. So it's really an incredible complex situation that you just would not expect spiders to have evolved to do absolutely and it's it's not just gift giving there are other amazing behaviors as well one of my favorites is is uh, the the strat tactic of the little jumping spiders tell us about these oh thank you honestly these are one of my favorite groups jumping spiders um peacock spiders we probably most people have probably heard about these um, so far, as far as I'm aware, there's 66 species that have been described, all but one in Australia. They're really tiny, um, but when you look at them close up, the one on the left is a peacock spider, and they're so called because what the male does is he raises his abdomen, and when he uh, inflates his abdomen with blood and, and hemolymph, it's called, it expands the abdomen out, and he has little fringe of hairs on the edge of the abdomen and it fans out the whole abdomen and then he will flap it forwards and side to side. And it's thought to resemble a peacock bird because obviously they have the very long tail feathers, which they shimmer and whatever for courtship. And this is all about courtship. And what each species has a different pattern. Um, and they use it in a species specific dance. Um, and you can see here the, the male on the left is raising a third pair of legs and he'll wave the legs like semaphore. So he'll combine his flapping of his abdomen with his leg waggling. And what they do, they do this kind of really strange kind of robotic movement as well with their legs. All of that combined is a species-specific dance to a uh, court female. And um, you'll see if the female is accepts the male courtship dance, then she'll do a little half-hearted dance back. Um, but if he doesn't get it right, she will quite often eat him. So you know, you've got to be careful if you're Absolutely. a male. Absolutely. <laughs> These dances are absolutely amazing. And we, we, we don't have any film footage, unfortunately, to show today, but there's plenty of footage online, isn't there, of, of the little peacock spiders dance. So after the show, go and go and have a look. They're absolutely amazing. But we are almost out of time. But there, there is uh, one more question that I'm very keen to, to put to you, Jan, because it came in 
a little earlier. Let me see if I can find it. Yep. So this was from Elijah, age six, and Felicity, age four, on Facebook. Um, and they think you are super cool and super funny, Jan, of course. Thank but, you. <laughs> but they were wondering. Super which... weird as that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> They were wondering which spider you like best in the whole world. Oh, <laughs> I do have several favourites, I'll be honest. But the one, this one species of spider that has the most meaning is the black and white zebra spider that you find in the UK. And in fact, actually, I have got a tattoo of that on my arm. I don't know oh, if you wow. see that. I'm not saying anybody should go out and get tattoos, certainly not children. Look, can you see that on there? Wow. The yep. reason why I got that spider is because that's the species of spider that got me liking spiders when I was a small child. And in fact, it's due to my mum showing my sister and I these zebra spiders, um, how amazing they are that made me like spiders. And so that I've, you know, that's one of my favourite species, definitely. Oh, that's fantastic! And I, I have to say, jumping spiders are actually one of the one of the uh, groups of spiders that have have made me, as I found out more about spiders, they've made me a lot less nervous and a lot more. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they're very very cute. So yes, they they've helped they me a lot. They are very cute. <laughs> Absolutely, and finding out more about spiders generally has has been really really helpful as well, and, and getting rid of a bit of that fear. Good, I hope so. But it's a shame we haven't got longer, but thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you for your amazing and diverse questions. That's been really interesting. It's been fantastic speaking to you today, Jaydan. I wish we had longer. We'll we'll get you back on. We'll do a we'll do another show in the future, I'm sure. But but thank you. I shall you search out so some much. more live spiders for that. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say goodbye to you for now. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> And, and thank you again to you, our viewers, for your fantastic questions. It's been absolutely brilliant um, getting them all in and, and, and Jan being able to answer them so fantastically. So thank you so, so much for joining us. We will be back on Friday at 10.30. We have a, a chat with one of our wildlife photographers of the year from our competition. So don't miss that one. And we are, of course, back um, every Tuesday at 12 and every Friday at 10.30. Check our website and our social media feeds to, to find out what's coming up. But for now, we'll say goodbye, have a fantastic day, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.